the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19. And we're going to look at verses 16 through 30 uh, in Matthew's Gospel as we continue in this series on heaven. We've been looking at um, the great promises that God gives us, but it's not just a future-oriented um, promise. It's something that actually changes, can change, if we get a firm really clear vision and picture of what heaven is described of in the scriptures that it changes the way that we live now it's very very practical it's not just oh things will be better sometime by and by and so that's our goal again today as we look at this text here Matthew 19 um, in fact I've referenced this passage a few times already in this series so today we'll just kind of dig in on it a little bit more Matthew 19 16 through 30 this is God's word it's inspired by the Holy Spirit So let's listen for the Holy Spirit to speak as we uh, listen to it now. Just then, a man came to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? And Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. And then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, well then who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Let's take a moment to pray. We're grateful, Father, um, that you are present here by your Holy Spirit um, with us. So we have confidence then to ask you to teach us to ask you to speak in a very personal way to each person here. Uh, I can't do that, Lord, but you can do it. And I pray you do it through me, um, that we are able to have ears to hear, each one of us, what you would say to us, because what you would say to us is always good. It's always for our best, even if it's hard. And so, Father, we pray for your help uh, through your Holy Spirit to hear and to be changed a little bit more today. Um, For your glory and our joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this particular encounter is actually uh, mentioned in three Gospels, three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all talk about this same event. And we get a couple extra details when you look at all three of those. So uh, it's typically this person is called the rich young ruler. And the reason that is is because Matthew, what we've just read, his account of it, tells us that this is a young man who is rich. And then uh, Luke tells us that he is a ruler. Um, So we pull these things together. We say, here's a 
very rich, a wealthy young man, probably from an inheritance, we don't know, um, but also a ruler, someone who has a status in his community, a position uh, of authority and respect. Um, and by his own accounting, this young man is morally pretty good. Like he knows God's law, and he respects it and honors it, and he seeks to follow it as best he can. And you say, well, this is by his own accounting. But we don't see anything in the text, so I'm trying to give this guy the benefit of the doubt here. Because the first response is, well, he walks away from Jesus, so he can't be any good. But here's the thing. I think there's something in this man that I think is in all of us, for one thing. But also, I think he truly is searching. I, I don't think he's trying to blow smoke at anybody when he says, these are commandments that I know and I keep. Nobody from the crowd contradicts that. So here's a morally good, young, rich, wealthy, and kind of a status person of, of, of ruling, and really anything that everybody would ever want. I mean, this guy seems to have it. It doesn't say, but I'm guessing he's also really good looking because it's hard to be young and rich and not good looking all at the same time, right? I mean, you look at it and it's like, now that's a life to aspire to. But also, by his own accounting, I'm missing something. I know you're looking at my life and you think I got it all together, but he's publicly, and this is the part I appreciate, he's publicly saying, I don't. There's something missing. And he's at least honest enough to say it. Because honestly, I think he gets further along than, than many people. Because there are a lot of people that know, deep down, I'm missing something. People can look at my life and think that it's okay. But I know there's something, there's a little hole there, there's a little gap there, and I can't figure out what it is. But a lot of people at that point, because fear of embarrassment, or for whatever the reasons, will push it down. Well, let's not think about that too much. I've got a lot of things to do. I'm a busy person. I've got to make a living. I've got to make my life go. And I don't want to think or dwell on that too much. But I would say at least this guy is willing to come out in public and to say to Jesus, amongst others, I don't have it all together. Well, what am I missing? Now, part of the issue is that this guy seems to be, even his language in the text that we read is, he sees life as addition. Like, you get life by adding something more to your life. Jesus, I'm lacking something. What can I get? What do I need to do to get eternal life? How can I add to my life? Because that's the way I work. And wealth will do that. You know, if you have money and you're needing something, it's not even a second thought. You just get it and add it to your life. So his thinking is, I'm missing something. I've heard something about this Jesus. Like when people come away from an encounter with him, they seem to not be missing something. Like their life seems full. Maybe he could tell me the thing that I'm missing and I'd be happy to add it. So he comes to Jesus looking for what he's missing. And then Jesus' response, which I want to dive into a little bit here. So let's just kind of meditate on Jesus' response. Look at verses 17 and 21 where Jesus is going to respond. You're looking for this good what good thing must I add and then Jesus responds says there's only one who's good so Jesus is trying to say something to him there with that then he goes on and he'll say if you want to be perfect go sell all your possessions give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and then come follow me so let's look at each one of that piece real quick when the young man says what good thing must I do to gain eternal life to get it Jesus right away says so you're talking about a good thing any time that you mention good, Jesus is going to come right at this and say, you know, there is no good thing apart from the only one who's good. So the first thing that he's trying to help the young man to see is what you're really striving for is an impossibility, but here's what it is. You want morality without a master. You want goodness without God. And this is one of the things that Jesus is right away going to say. The feeling that you're missing something is in part because you've structured your life in such a way that you say, look, you just try to be a good person. That's what life is about. And as soon as you say good, you're saying that there's something that might exist apart from God. And we've said this already in this series lots of times, so let me say it again. There is no good thing apart from God. 
And it's not as if God creates good things that are here kind of separate, and then God is just kind of jealously guarding them. God, I need a good thing. Well, I don't know if I'm going to give it to you. No, it's actually connected to the very essence of God. It flows from God's character. God can't ultimately give you any good thing without also giving you him. Those two are so bound together that Jesus is making the point here. You, you're talking about a good thing. There's only one God who is good. And so you can't separate morality from a master. You can't separate goodness from God. I know, I mean, this has been the predominant ethic of our culture for a long time now. At least I hear it over and over again. Here's the ethic. As long as it doesn't hurt anybody, it's okay. That's how you measure what's good. It's, it's okay as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, but I have still, to, to this day, I have yet to hear somebody connect who it might hurt with God. It's always with other people. Well, as long as it doesn't hurt someone else. You mean you're saying it's possible that my actions could hurt God? That sounds funny to people. How can I hurt God? Well, some gods, yeah, are so distant or remote or separated from, in other religions, from who we are. There's no way that you could do that. But the God of the scriptures is a very, he makes himself vulnerable. So if you say, how could I possibly hurt? You can dishonor God. I can dishonor God with my sin. I can mock God with my sin. I can slap God in the face with my sin. I can condemn God with my sin. I can flog God with my sin. I can crucify God with my sin. I can kill God in the flesh with my sin. So when we talk about an ethic, oh, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone, Jesus is saying, there's only one who's good. Have you considered that all of your trying to be good here is missing God? It's very interesting because people look at the commandments and Jesus starts listing commandments. Keep the commandments. Which ones? And if you've noticed, some of those sound like the Ten Commandments, don't they? Jesus starts on the list. Yeah, no, don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. But you notice in the te Ten Commandments, Jesus skipped the first four of the Ten Commandments, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, look, you come to me saying that you're missing something? Let me see if you can catch what I'm omitting. What am I omitting? Well, you didn't mention anything about the commandments having to do with God, especially like the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And this is a, cle a key right here. Jesus is saying, what you're missing is trying to keep God separate from the rest of your life. Well, what do I do when you say, sell your possessions, give to the poor? Jesus says, sell your possessions, give it to the poor. Now, this young man knows his commandments. He knows the scripture. I have to believe it doesn't say it, but I believe this really clearly from the text that he probably almost certainly knows about tithing. Tithing is an Old Testament commandment, a law within the law. And in the Old Testament, it says tithing went kind of basically taking 10% of what you brought in and making sure you took 10%, gave it to the Lord. That's your offering. I have to believe that this guy's a very consistent tither. He's given 10% because he's saying, I know the law and I keep it. The law says I give 10%, no problem. I set that aside, I give it. What am I missing? And you can hear Jesus saying, well, think about the math. What do you might, I'm giving 10%, what am I missing? What about the other 90%? How about, Jesus says, if you want to know what you're missing, give it all. I want to be good, but I don't want to be that good. I mean, hold on a second, that's going a little bit overboard, don't you think? Sell all my possessions, give those proceeds to the poor? I mean, that's a little bit over the top. In fact, when we read this, it makes us all a little bit squirmy, and then some people will say, which is true, Hey, you ever notice that Jesus never really commands out of anybody else in all the other encounters that you see Jesus with people? He never says to them, sell all your possessions and come follow me. And so we're like, 
yeah, so maybe that means I don't have to, <laughs> that's just a special case he's got with this guy, and so we all breathe a sigh of relief. We don't have to sell all our possessions. And it's true. There are many cases where Jesus doesn't make that demand at all. In fact, there are some cases, remember the guy who had a legion of demons in him? And Jesus casts them out and frees this man. He's living in the tombs, a miserable existence. Now he's freed. And the man, before Jesus gets in the boat, it's on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, begs Jesus, Jesus, I want to leave everything. This is my hometown, all of my family, everything that I have is here in this town. I want to leave it all and follow you. And Jesus specifically says, no, I want you to go back to your home. Tell of all that the Lord has done for you. I want you to keep it all. And so what is Jesus driving at when he says, sell all of your possessions? Well, we say, well, we have to have a willingness to give it all. That's usually how we describe this. Well, he doesn't mean that I sell everything. We obviously all haven't sold all of our stuff and we're followers of Jesus. It just means we have to be willing to do it. Just be careful when we say that. And I say that because this is the way it works, at least for me. We're at home. My wife, Laura, says, is there any pie left? Which is a big question in our household usually. And I, I say, well, let me check. And then I come back and I say, there's one piece left. Now, at that moment, my wife, she's always generous this way. She's like, well, then you can have it. Now, I want to be, I want to out-spiritualize her usually in these moments. And so I'm like, no, 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 no. No, let me be like Jesus here. You have the last piece of pie. I mean, uh, that really is what I should do as a husband. I should, I should serve you in this way. You ha and she's like, no, really, it's okay. I don't want it. You can have it. I'm like, no, no, I insist. You, you should have the piece of pie. And she says, okay. So I get her the piece of pie. I give her the pie, I turn around, and I'm mumbling all the way back to the kitchen. I can't believe that she's eating the last piece of pie. I cannot believe that she actually took me up on this because at some point I can say to God, I'm willing, everything is yours. And then the second God begins to make a claim and say, good, I've let you keep it and use it and steward it all this time, but today I would like it. And then it reveals our hearts. See, because in that moment, it's not hypothetical anymore. Now it's real. This happens not just with your stuff. I don't know about you, but when I, for me, when I start my day, I'm a very kind of organized in my head kind of person. I have a plan, a purpose. We're going to enter the day. This is what we're going to do here, and then we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. And next thing you know, out of the blue, Jesus shows up and intervenes and interjects and says, I want your time today, right here, right now. And I'm like, man, alive, that's not going to fit, Jesus. I've got a lot of things lined up. And he's like, no, you said, when I said that I'm going to be your master, your Lord, you, you gave it all to me. Today I make a claim on your time. And Jesus, if he's Lord, not just Savior, we all like the idea that God will forgive me my sins, Oh, yes, I, I believe in you. If that's what it takes, whatever it is, forgive my sins, and then I'm freed from that. But he's also Lord. He, he's the one that we follow as disciples, which means we give up all of our rights and we say, Jesus has the right to interrupt you. He has the right to interrupt your day if he's Lord. And so he says to the young man, I want you to sell it all. The thing is, if you can't let it go, whether it's your time or whether it's your money, then you don't have money. Your money has you. If you can't let it go, at some point what I'm really saying, if I'm holding on to it and Jesus is saying, give it to me, then I'm basically saying, my hope is in this, not in you. I can't let that go because that's what I'm really counting on, Jesus, and I'm not counting on you. So our hearts really get revealed when Jesus actually says, today I want you to give me something that I've let you keep all this time. No other gods before me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay, maybe this is what he's missing. But then he adds to follow me. This is the Lord. You need a master. It's not just morality. You've got to have a master. Your morality has nothing to rest on without a master. And so Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. But then notice this, and this is the part that I think gets missed. Here's our topic of heaven. You're like, oh, so being a Christian means I'm going to sacrifice. 
I sacrifice it all to you, Jesus. But that's not what the text says. Did you see this? Jesus isn't actually saying, give it all to me because I'm Lord and you're just my servant. He actually is setting an exchange. That's what the text actually says. Then you will have treasure in heaven. You will have treasure in heaven. So it's not a sacrifice, it's this exchange. You give me rights over all of your life. You give up all your wealth, sell your possessions, give it to the poor. And then I guess I'm just supposed to kind of muddle on in life and say I'm sacrificing for Jesus. No, I'm just going to give you treasures in heaven. So it's this, this is the gospel. So this is, this is kind of a fine line here, but it's important. Many times our words kind of bring this out. We say, Jesus died for me, and it's good, don't get me wrong here, it's good to have gratitude in our hearts. But it is not the gospel when we begin to say, now my life is about paying it back. Because as soon as we do that, we're basically saying, I'm the one who's making the sacrifice. But when Jesus says, I'm going to give you treasures in heaven in exchange for you giving me all of your life, then we say, but that's not, that's not really fair because I think I'm going to end up better off. I can't pay it back if you're always going to give me more. And that's exactly what the gospel is saying. It's not this, I'm going to earn it or pay it back. It is this grace that comes to us and overwhelms us such that the rich young man could say, if he really got this, so I give up these possessions. But you know what? That is nothing compared to forgiveness. Like real forgiveness that goes down to the deepest levels of my guilt and my shame to be removed, have that removed, nothing would be comparing to that. I would be gladly give up these things because that forgiveness, that treasure is so much better. Nothing compares to wearing Jesus' righteousness instead of fancy clothes. Being admired and part of a wealthy family, being looked up to by other people is nothing compared to being fully adopted as a child of God. It doesn't even compare. It's nothing compared to being loved and accepted at my worst, not my best. Not when people are saying he's a good moral person. No, at my very worst to be loved. Now that is priceless. This is what Jesus is offering in the gospel. And it's the only way that these things make sense. When we say, boy, they made a great sacrifice for Jesus. I'm not saying that it's not difficult and there's not a grief and a struggle in this, but understand, it makes no sense. Hebrews 10.34, great persecution in the first century. Christians were being killed for their faith. And this is what it said. You suffered along with those in prison, and uh, this is the part that gets you, joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Because, why? You knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. Treasure, the treasure of heaven, which is Christ himself. That's why you could joyfully, does it mean without tears, without a struggle? No, it means there's this underlying joy that says, but I got something better. There's something way better than this stuff. And then, of course, even in our, closer to our own time, this is the famous quote from missionary Jim Elliott who was uh, killed as a missionary in Ecuador back in the 50s. And when this happened, um, he had a great line that's been very, very popular, people quote it all the time. But in his, in his journal before he was killed, he wrote, one of the great blessings of heaven is the appreciation of heaven on earth. That's our series. That's what we're talking about all this time. One of the great blessings of heaven is the appreciation of heaven on earth now. And then comes the famous quote, he is no fool, who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. It's fleeting. I can't hold on to it. And Jesus asked me to give it up now so that I can have what is always going to be eternal. I can't lose it. And it comes by grace. So this explains Jesus' odd statement when Jesus, afterwards the disciples were like, if a rich person, which was always assumed to be somebody blessed by God, can't get to heaven Jesus, you're saying it's hard. Well, actually, Jesus is saying it's worse than that. It's impossible, and it's not just a rich person. It's easier, Jesus says, here's the phrase, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. With man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible, and it's really important here. You may have heard a story 
um, maybe it's been preached sometime that you've heard it, that, hey, when Jesus says it's, it's hard to get a camel through a needle's eye, and you're like, yeah, that's impossible. But I've heard somebody say that there's this gate in Jerusalem, and it's called the needle's eye gate, and a, a camel really could get through it if a camel would get down on its knees, which is kind of a sign of humble, humbleness and repentance, and the camel could get through this if he would humble himself. And, and that's a great sound and story. Unfortunately, it's just a fable. There's absolutely zero historical evidence that such a gate ever existed in Jerusalem. And furthermore, it misses the point. The point Jesus is making, he makes it clear. He says, it's impossible. I'm telling you, the largest land animal in all of Palestine at the time, a camel, trying to get through the smallest thing that a human being could make, which is the eye of a needle, it can't happen. It's impossible. Well, then, Jesus, what, how is this good news? Well, it starts with this bad news, doesn't it? This is what Romans says, Romans 7, or Romans 8. The mind governed by the flesh, that's our sinful nature, every one of us, is hostile to God does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. That's another way to say impossible. My sinful nature cannot submit to God as Lord over my life. And you say, but people make decisions for Jesus, don't they? We call you to, absolutely. It can't happen without God's intervention. You and I have never made a decision for Jesus entirely on our own. Always the work of the Holy Spirit to make it possible. Otherwise, it's impossible. So the great good news is that by grace, we're able to come to Jesus and say, so my, my desire, which wasn't there before, is really from you. And I mean, you see this all the time. One day, somebody sees church as the most boring thing in the world. You want to go to church? I'd rather have a root canal. I mean, really? Do I want to go to church? No, I don't want to go to church. One day, that's how exciting church is. The next day, you can't keep people out of the church. Something changed. Well, one day, somebody's like, the most boring book in the world is the Bible. It's so confusing, I don't understand it. And you have absolutely no desire to read it whatsoever. And the next day, there's this hunger. Like, that's where I want to be. Even when I don't understand it, that's how hungry I am. I know there's something here that God's word is speaking to me. One time, one day in your life, pornography is the most compelling thing in your life. And the next day, you have no taste for it, no desire for it, and all you want to do is see the glory of God. And the question is, how does that happen? How does it go one day to the next other than the Holy Spirit comes and breaks through and enables what is otherwise impossible and plants? God can take an old stone heart and he can be that surgeon and implant a new heart of flesh that has new desires that you never had before. We call it being born again. That's new birth. And it's a miracle every time it happens. And it happened to one of the guys in our text, Peter. Do you remember when Peter first came to Jesus? He knew about Jesus. He heard Jesus teach. His brother Andrew introduced him, but Peter was still a fisherman. But when you get to Luke chapter 5, and it describes Peter is still a fisherman. Jesus is on the shore. He wants to talk to a big crowd. He says, Peter, you got a fishing boat. Can you just take me out a little bit? The acoustics will be much better. They'll be able to hear me teach. Sure enough, I'll take you out. He takes him out. Jesus finishes teaching. And at the end of that, Jesus says, as long as we're out here, let's go fishing. And Peter goes, you know what? You're a great teacher, but a lousy fisherman. Because we've been fishing all stinking night and we've caught nothing. And we are professionals. We're, 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 this is commercial fishermen. And we, we know what we're doing, Jesus. And it's not going to work. And Jesus says, trust me, put the nets out. All right, because you say so. He puts the nets out. And Peter gets the greatest catch of fish he's ever had as a fisherman. It's so great it begins to break the nets. And in that moment, Peter goes, this is no coincidence. This didn't just happen Jesus just said this would happen, and now it's happened, and suddenly, this is so interesting, Peter's response is not, this is awesome, Peter's response is, oh my word, I'm in the boat with God, and Jesus, you need to get away from me, because I'm a sinful sinful person. He knows it in a second, 
I don't deserve anything from you because you're holy and I'm a sinner. Go away from me. And here's this beautiful breakthrough of the gospel because in that moment, I've got to believe they've locked eyes. And Jesus says to him, don't be afraid. I did not come here as God in the flesh to squash you. I came to love you. Peter, trust me, come with me, follow me. And in that moment, it says, Peter, on the day when he has the biggest catch of fish, I mean, this is like you guys at harvest time. Imagine you had your best harvest ever coming up, and you, you gather it all in, but before you sell it, you say, I am done with farming because I have found a treasure that's greater than this. And Peter says, I found a treasure greater than fish. It's this love from God in the flesh that I don't deserve. It's by grace. And Peter is filled with joy that Jesus wants me as messed up and broken as I am. He wants me. And I'm thrilled to follow him, to give it all up. And he leaves his fishing business behind. He gives it all up. And that's where it picks up in our story here because something happened from that joy to this moment where Peter has lost his joy. Verse 27, Peter answered Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. You got to believe he's thinking of that day, that great catch of fish, the big windfall finally for my business. The Roman taxes are sucking me dry, but I've got this great catch of fish and I left it for you. And something got flipped here. That day, he was thrilled to leave it. This day, but what are we going to get? I've sacrificed for you, Jesus. What am I going to get out of this? He's lost his joy in here. And it's all because he lost view of grace. Because there's something that happens. I wish it wouldn't, but if you have walked with Jesus just a short time, be prepared the pride that keeps us hostile to God, keeps us away from God, and God breaks through it, and we think, I'm done with it, but it creeps back into our lives as Christians. I don't care how long you've walked with Jesus. It is clawing its way back to say, at some point, all of this for Jesus becomes entitlement. I've done this for you, Jesus. My goodness, I've gone to church every Sunday for as many Sundays as I can even remember. I've read my Bible. I've prayed. I've tithed. I've given. I've done serving people all over the place. And at some point, it becomes not about grace, but it becomes about, I've done this for you. What are you going to do for me? We don't have time, but read this when you get home. Keep reading in Matthew into chapter 20 because Jesus connects this with something that he's going to say, a, a parable in chapter 20. And it, it's a great parable because it will irritate the snot out of you. It really will. And that's a lot of irritation when it does that. But here's what it does. It takes people who are working day laborers and guys who work at the beginning of the day work all day long and a guy, some guys who work just the last hour of the day and they get paid all the same. We're Midwesterners. That's not right. You know, you, you, you got to earn your living. You can't have free handouts to people getting paid a full day's wage when they worked one hour. We're sweating like dogs over here working all day, and we got paid the same. And the only difference in the parable, notice this when you read it, the early workers made a contract. They're the ones who said to the landowner, hey, you have to agree to this contract. You will pay us a full day's wage because we're not going to go into this without knowing the wage. And the last guys did not make a contract with the landowner. You know what they said? The landowner says, I'll pay you whatever is right. And they said, we'll take it. Are you kidding me? Because if we don't get paid today, we don't eat. That's what day, day laborers did. <sighs> whatever you pay us is, is going to be awesome. We'll take it. We'll trust. That here's the difference. We'll trust the landowner to do what's right versus we have a contract with the landowner. And when my Christian walk, my following after Jesus becomes a contract, we lose joy. We will absolutely suck the life out of your joy. Peter is like, we've left everything. 
What's well, going to be for us? And so great how Jesus doesn't say, now I've got to punish you for, for kind of asking that and losing sight of grace and all that. But Jesus says, no, don't you understand, Peter? Look at this, verses 28 and 29. I tell you, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, that's heaven. That's what we've been talking about. That's heaven. The renewal of all things. When God makes all things right, all the wrongs right, when God brings back, as he says here, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields, and we could probably put in there, or fish or whatever else you want to put in there, for my sake, Jesus says, will receive, here's the promise, a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life at the renewal of all things. This is the kingdom. He says, you will not have lost anything. Now, when I say this, you're like, Cliff, you're taking the edge off of these great stories that I have often even told in, st in sermons of people who sacrifice everything for Jesus. Because in the end, what this text is telling us is we never actually sacrifice. To sacrifice means it's gone. You've given it up. It never comes back. Jesus is saying, you never really lose anything in the end. In fact, you get it a hundred times more in the end. So actually, you never actually, you give up everything and lose nothing. And what this means is, you say, well, that takes the edge off of people giving up something, for G giving up their lives even. But it doesn't really, does it? It actually shifts the glory from the person who's doing that to God as it's intended to do. The glory doesn't go to us when we give something up to the Lord because we're going to get it all back a hundred times over. But it goes to the glory of a God who is so generous. This is the way the scriptures put it. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up, God sacrificing, gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? God sacrifices, Jesus sacrifices, 2 Corinthians 8. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. See, there's another rich young ruler here. There's a rich young ruler who's being asked to give up everything. But there was a rich young ruler in Jesus who did give up everything. And he was richer by far than this rich young man could ever dream. He might be wealthy, but this rich young ruler, Jesus, he owned the cattle on a thousand hills. He's the owner of all creation. He owns it all. And he emptied himself, Philippians 2 says, he empties himself of that. And he's a ruler. And he's not just a ruler over a little town, a little province, not a little bit of influence. He's a ruler over all creation. And he empties himself and becomes a slave, a servant for us. This is the God that we serve. And Jesus does all this because we're talking about treasures. You are his treasure. You are his treasure. In the Bible it says our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Revelation says that. But it also says there are other places in the Bible where we're written on him. Isaiah 49 says we're written on the palms of his hands. Because Jesus, when he dies, is like, you are worth it to me. I die for you because you are worth it. And it also says, and this is a picture that I really love, the high priest would go in to the Holy of Holies and he would wear this ephod that would have all these precious stones that had the names of all the children of Israel, all the tribes engraved on those precious stones right over his heart, which is one of the greatest pictures because who's our high priest? Jesus. And he intercedes for us continually now in the true holy of holies and your name is right here and he says I emptied myself because you're worth it to me you're my treasure and once that begins to hit and the grace of that begins to hit and we're like it's never about trying to pay it back it's never about earning it it's never about I serve God so then here's the contract God then has to do this he has to protect my life and bless my life but it's like it's all grace and he empties himself completely simply because, you're like, gosh, Lynn, this is so great. Because of the great love of the Father. So great is his love for us. And he's saying, you're my treasure. Don't you know this? Because if you know it, 
then heaven doesn't have to wait. You don't have to wait for heaven. Here, I'll close with this picture of it. When you know that you're going to be blessed for everything that you would ever give up for Jesus, it's like the little girl who goes to her grandparents. And grandfather, they've got this big bowl of candy. And grandfather's like, you want some candy? Because that's what we do as grandparents. Yeah, feel free. Have your parents aren't here. Go have some candy. She goes, yes, I do want some candy. He says, go ahead and you can have some. And she doesn't take any. He says, don't you want any? Well, yes, I do. He's like, well, here. And so grandpa reaches in, gives her a handful. Here's some candy. She takes it. She loves it. Later, though, her grandmother pulls her aside. She's like, how come you didn't take the candy when your grandfather said, grandpa said you could have some? And she said, well, because grandpa's hands are way bigger than mine, <laughs> right? Isn't that it? That's the essence of this. The reason that we can give up anything in this life now, and it gives us this holy boldness, I'm not saying it won't hurt. I'm not saying it's easy or simple. I'm just saying when you really believe that God is going to give back and his hands are way bigger, then I don't have to go through life trying to grab and add to my life because I know his hands are way bigger and he's going to bless me beyond anything that I could grab for myself. And those who know it, God is glorified because it's not about what I do for God. It's all of his giving to us. Let's pray.